Hello, everyone, and we are going to begin Chapter 6, which is dealing with unemployment. And in this first lecture, we're going to give an overview of the chapter, and then we're going to take a little bit of time and talk about the actual measurement of unemployment. If you remember, I told you back in Chapter 2 that we were going to skip that and save the measuring of unemployment until Chapter 6 when we're talking about it. And, well, it's Chapter 6, and so now it's time to talk about that. So brief overview of the chapter. We're breaking this up into four lectures. And actually, there'll be a fifth lecture where I'm going to um, actually demonstrate some stuff with an Excel simulation. Um, but in lectures um, one, we're going to talk a little bit about how um, unemployment is measured and some of the problems and challenges in measuring unemployment and where the data comes from. In lecture two, we're going to talk about the natural rate of unemployment and a model for determining this. Now lecture two is going to be really, really important because it's going to be the first time you may have ever seen a dynamic macroeconomic model. That's, that is a model that has an evolution over time. It feeds back on itself over time. In lecture three, we're going to start talking about well, why is there unemployment in the first place? Lecture two, we've talked about this natural rate of unemployment. Well, what's natural about unemployment? So the first part of that, we'll be talking about the job search. In lecture four, um, we will continue to answer this question, why is there unemployment, by looking at unemployment caused by the actual structure of the economy and changes in the structure of the economy, or what's called sectoral shifts first thing we're going to do is we're going to break the population down into some categories. So we're going to define each one of these terms. And it's important to remember this because, well, these statistics just don't make sense at all unless you have, um, unless you can remember these definitions. So first of all, employed, that means you're working at a paid job, so you're working. Unemployed means you are not employed, but you're actively looking for a job. Okay, so to be unemployed is not to just not have a job. There's lots of people who don't have jobs who are not considered to be unemployed. You must, to be unemployed, be actively looking for a job. The labor force. The labor force is the total number of people who are out there either working or actively looking for a job. So when we think about the labor force, we think about this. You have to be willing to work, able to work, um, and either working or not working. Right? But you have to be willing to work, able to work, actively looking or working to be in the labor force. And then not in the labor force. Those are people who are not unemployed but are not participating in the labor market. So for example, if you decide to someday retire, you will no longer have a job. Why will you not have a job? Because you're retired. Well, if you're retired, you're not looking for a job, and therefore we would not consider you to be in the labor force, and therefore we wouldn't consider you to be unemployed. So, of course, this is going to lead to, these categories lead to all kinds of issues in measuring unemployment and questions over how accurate our measure of unemployment is. So to break this down just a little bit more um, and give you a little better idea of what these definitions mean. This is um, just the population as, as it was divided up back in 2009. Now the fact that these this is 2009, that was a long time ago, it's not, not very up-to-date statistics, really isn't all that important for this particular um, demonstration. What I'm looking at here is, well, just get an idea of how we break up the um, population. So the first thing is we have the civilian labor force. Then what we do is from the civilian labor force, we break that down to the non-institutionalized population. Okay, and we talk about institutionalized, like for example, people in prison, they would be institutionalized. People in um, who are in long-term care facilities, uh, people who are um, essentially unable to work. And notice up at the top here we have a civilian population. We generally take out the military when we're looking at these um, numbers, mostly because we think it kind of would throw things off. Because, well, the military, well, we're going to hire them no matter what. All right? You, you know, the, the, the level of hiring and, and employment in the military armed services isn't, shouldn't be, you know, subject to business cycle fluctuations. Uh, um, 
uh, well, it certainly shouldn't be, whether or not it is or not, but certainly shouldn't be. And therefore, um, we kind of take those out because we're worried that, well, that'll make the picture look a little bit better than it actually is because we have all of those people who are employed. So we focus on the civilian population, then the non-institutionalized civilian population. Then, out of that, there might be some people who are in school. So if you're going to school full-time, say you're a sophomore in college, and you have no job, you may not be considered unemployed. Why not? Because you're in school. You've chosen not to be in the labor force in order to invest in your human capital. Okay, so we have a certain number of people who are not in the labor force because for some reason they're not participating. And then finally, we break that down, the labor force, into the employed and the unemployed. And notice this. The labor force in 2009 was just a little more than half the civilian population. Now we're going to talk about that in a little bit. We'll call that the labor force participation rate, or the labor force divided by total civilian population is what's called the labor force participation rate. And that's sometimes considered a measure of the degree to which um, people are willing and able to participate in the labor market. You know, If that drops too low, then maybe economic times have been bad for a very long time and people are really discouraged. Um, if it gets very high, Maybe the opposite. We don't. We don't know. So um, that's that's one statistic we take a look at. But the labor force participation rate is 50 percent of the population, and then we break that down into employed and unemployed. So this unemployment rate is equal to unemployed divided by the labor force. Now, what's important about that? Well, look at that. I mean, that when it says it's 8% of the population, it's not 8% of the population. It's 8% of the labor force. All right, so that's important to note. All of these different categorizations cause, well, controversy in the um, accuracy of measurement of unemployment. So the unemployment rate, we talked about this just a little bit, is the percentage of the labor force that is unemployed. All right. Remember, the percentage of the unemployment or the unemployment rate is not the percentage of the population that's unemployed. It's the percentage of the labor force that's unemployed. Okay. And the labor force participation rate is the fraction of the adult population that participates in the labor force, or it's essentially um, that ratio we talked about. Now. Here's the next wrinkle in how we measure all this. The, the next thing is there's, there's a lot of people in the United States. So it's not like we can just go ask everybody or measure everybody. We have to take a sample, and we have to use a survey to do that. And so to measure employment statistics, we have two surveys that we use. The first is called the household survey. And what this does is the household survey actually calls up people and asks them, are you working? And they have a list of questions that they ask. But essentially what it does is it asks, are you working or are you not working? Are you actively looking or are you not actively looking? And they have a system of questions that tries to get a little more accurate than just asking people flat out. But um, that's essentially what's going on. We're asking actual people. The next is called the establishment survey. The establishment survey goes and asks businesses, how many people do you employ? All right, so the way to understand this is when you see unemployment, okay, that's a total number unemployed, it's usually you, all right, or employment, total people employed, okay, labor force comes from this, and the unemployment rate all comes from the household survey. Okay, total non farm. All right, total non farm employment comes from this establishments survey. Now, which one's more accurate? Well, it really depends on the question you're asking. 
Um, there's a couple of reasons why the establishment survey is a little better data than the household survey, and there's a couple of reasons why the household survey is a little better than the establishment survey. So we, we, we should talk about that just a little bit. And it really comes down to what question you're trying to ask. If you want to know how many people are employed who live within a certain area, the household survey is fine. If you want to know how many jobs are actually going on within a certain area, you need the establishment survey. Because if you think about it, the household survey, I'm calling households. So how I determine where it is that I'm calling is based on where that person lives. Well, that doesn't necessarily mean they work there. So I could live in River Falls, Wisconsin, and work in Minneapolis, Minnesota. Well. The household survey would count me as employed towards the Wisconsin statistics, and the establishment survey would count me as employed counting towards the Minnesota statistics, because the household looks at where I live, and the establishment survey looks at where I work. So oftentimes when we look at this question, how many jobs were created within a given area, we want to look at the establishment survey. Um, there's some other issues why the establishment survey might be a little better in some cases. Um, one of those is the establishment survey, the survey methodology. So some of this, these techniques used in collecting the data turn out to be a little bit better in the establishment survey. Specifically, the sample size is bigger. All right, there's a few other really technical issues that make it a little better data, but there's also some other problems, though. The establishment survey is not very good at picking up changes in the business cycle. So when we go from everything being really, 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 really good, good, good to the economy peaking, and then all of a sudden, boom, things are going to go start going, you know, the wrong way. Um, the establishment survey will miss that sometimes. And on the other side, when things it really has a hard time with finding out when we're starting to go on the upswing. And the reason for that is when we start to improve, we start to have a lot of new firms. When we have these new firms, well, the PLS doesn't know about them yet. It might take them a month or two months to figure out, oh, I need to call XYZ firm, All right, to, just to get their information. Because you've got to remember, there's, BLS isn't just looking at you know Minneapolis or River Falls. They're looking at the whole United States. There's a lot of new firms every month in the whole United States. So these new firms oftentimes don't get counted um, for at least a couple of months um, into after they've been established. So that's one reason why sometimes the establishment survey can miss changes in or, or um, uh, you know inflection points in the business cycle. On the, and on the other hand, the establishment survey doesn't do a very good job of dealing with self-employed persons. That's why it's called non-farm uh, um, employment is what gets um, measured mainly from the establishment survey. And the reason why it's non-farm is most farms are sole proprietorships, small, um, independent, um, essentially self-employed um, entities. Well, it's really hard to track all that down. Now, we can get that in the household survey because that's who we're calling. We're calling households. But it's much more difficult in this establishment survey. So which one's better? It really depends on the question you're asking. So if we look at these two measures, so here is employment growth based on the household survey. Here's employment growth based on the establishment survey. And you'll see... Um, on the when we change from going down to going up, right? The establishment survey tends to overshoot, and on the upswing, it tends to overshoot just a little bit. That's because of that um, the sample not catching up with itself, right? It takes a few months for them to get new firms put in and old firms taken out. It's just that that's that's a challenge with this with the um, establishment survey. Um, but you'll also notice they move quite closely together. They're very, very close to one another.
Okay, so what about this, the unemployment rate? We really talk about this problem of accuracy of the unemployment rate. And the first thing to realize is the unemployment rate that you hear on the news is not the unemployment rate. It's what we call headline unemployment, or the one that essentially is the official unemployment rate. But there's actually six separate definitions of unemployment. The one we mainly use is called U3. All right, because it's a third of the six definitions. All right, and as we go from U1, U1 is very, very tight. It's it's um, very, very specific. Now, if you you are discouraged workers, no, we don't count those. Lots of things aren't. Lots of people aren't counted as unemployed because it's a very, very narrow definition of what the labor force is. Whereas U3 has a little broader definition, and then the broadest would be U6. Where we are, which is the so-called underemployment rate that tries to take into account not just those who are um, discouraged workers, but those who might be working part-time who'd like to work full-time. So we can talk about that in a minute. But when we get down to this, part of the problem is we don't count discouraged workers within this headline unemployment, U6, or I'm sorry, U3. Um, so people do not look for a job because they don't feel they have a chance of finding one, they would fall off the rolls. So they stop being a part of the labor force, and so we don't count them within the unemployment rate. Well, that could be a pretty big mistake if it's simply because they have had chronic long-term unemployment. Well, them falling off the rolls isn't a good thing, right? Um, it doesn't take into account underemployment. So underemployment is, let's say, for example, we have a nuclear physicist who decides to chuck it all and become a pizza delivery guy. You know, he got downsized at the um, university, and well, they decided he decided I got to do something, so I'm going to be a pizza delivery guy. Well, a nuclear physicist being a pizza delivery guy is something of a waste of materials, right? You're a little overqualified. Uh, in fact, you've got a lot of um, time and money and resources invested in that human capital to make you the nuclear physicist, and you're pretty much not using any of that. We call that underemployed. Another issue with underemployment are what we call these part-time workers, or what we what's referred to by the BLS as um, par workers who are part-time for economic reasons. They aren't choosing to be part-time, but part-time is the only job they can find. That's also considered underemployment. Why? Because we count them as fully employed. They have a job, and so they are now a part of the employed. Right? So this is uh, um, also a bit of an accuracy issue. It also finally includes people who say they're unemployed, but don't, but really aren't looking for a job. They go through all the motions that it takes to look through a job. They file for unemployment benefits. They go to the unemployment office just enough to make all the requirements, but they aren't really looking for a job. Well, these people would be incorrectly counted as unemployed. And so that's another issue with the accuracy of the unemployment rate. So don't get me wrong, the data is as good of data as we can make it. But the issue whenever we're measuring data is we're measuring the best we can. Really, we can't measure any better than that. And so after doing the best we can, this is our measurement. Um, uh, but you have to remember that the best that we can still isn't perfect. You know, this isn't the absolute truth as to what actually unemployment is or what the unemployment rate is. It's our estimate based on all the information that we can gather as to what the actual unemployment rate is.